Isn't it really when uh, we stand beside a grave and we realise that uh, we are still in a world where the enemy still has some control? On the other hand, it's a, a blessing to us to uh, have the knowledge that we have of uh, what the Lord has in store and the plan that God has in place because of the problem of, uh, of sin and uh, degeneration that plagues us in this old world. It's good to know that those uh, close to us, our loved ones, when they pass away, are simply asleep. And there they rest, and uh, the Lord has certainly uh, devised uh, the most, if we use the word humane, uh, the most humane means possible of uh, dealing with the problem of death. And uh, our sympathies go out to the Ford family, especially to June today, as uh, they uh, mourn the loss of uh, their mother, who uh, made 94 years, and I don't know whether it's generally known or not, but uh, they uh, were very, perhaps, uh, proud of the fact that her only time ever spent in hospital was only in the very recent uh, few months. And uh, that, that's a marvellous record, isn't it? Marvellous. And uh, we don't hear of many folk having such a basic stamina as that. Let's uh, <coughs> sing a hymn together, shall we? 382 is the hymn, O Day of Rest and Gladness. This uh, tune will be familiar to some people and perhaps not so familiar to others, but uh, it is a great tune uh, and fits the words of this hymn very well. It's 382, O Day of Rest and Gladness. You might like to uh, take your Bibles to the first chapter of the Bible, which of course is Genesis chapter 1 and the last verse of the first chapter. Last verse of the first chapter of the Bible. 
And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God saw everything that he had made and he was able to pass a judgment upon it which to us is probably worded here as if it was somewhat conditional. But God looked upon his work and said it was very good. When you look upon something that you have made, how often do you say that it's very good? Not too often. I've made all sorts of things in my life. I've made drains and canals and stop banks and roads. I've made ordinary pine trees into good pine trees, thousands and thousands of them, by pruning them and doing whatever you do to make pine trees grow. I've made dairy herds into scruffy dairy herds into good productive dairy herds. I've done all kinds of things in hobby stuff and I've looked at what I have done and I've said to myself, well, that's, and I use a word, pretty good. A bit like when I used to get my reports because I had my schooling on correspondence and the correspondence lessons used to come every fortnight in a little canvas uh, envelope and I'd look to see what the teacher would comment about in my schoolwork. And evidently the teacher wasn't too sure about how to mark things, I think, because so often it just said very fair. And I often wondered what very fair meant. I wonder if God looked at his work and he ticked it off and, and wrote a little comment, very fair. What would it mean to us today? God looked at his work and said it was very good. The word very good here comes from a Hebrew word which... Uh, is not so familiar throughout Scripture, actually, because uh, there is not a lot in Scripture that you can describe with this word. And the word means what we would today call superlative. And I think about the things that I've made, and I've seen a lot of things that other people have made, including my car, and a whole lot of other things, and I look at them and I can really say that that is superlative. Is that right? you can really say it's superlative. So we don't use the word superlative much, do we? But as teenagers, the word super was all the rage and everything was super. It's neat today, isn't it? Or something like that. But in those days, it was super. Everything was super. It came from the word superlative. And, uh, of course, nothing was, was really superlative. It was just a teenage fad word. So God created what he had made and he looked at it after having commented on each day's creation and said it was good, he now looks at his whole creation and he says it is superlative. In other words, it could not be made better. God himself could not do a better job of what he did in creation. And wouldn't you expect that of God? If God is God, everything that he does is perfect, it's superlative, it cannot be bettered. And as we think about creation today, we of course see that it doesn't always represent the work of God in that superlative fashion. But everything that God did was so good. Let's go on a little bit because the chapter divisions in our scripture were put there many years after this was written and they're not quite in the right places sometimes. So go to chapter 2, it says, Thus, or in this fashion, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. God decided that another day should be added to the week in order that his work should be contemplated and remembered. And even God looked upon his creation for a whole day. I wonder what that tells us. I wonder if it tells us that God was setting an example for the human race that he had just uh, started in its, uh, in its infancy 
with the creation of Adam and Eve, that they too should look at their creator and contemplate the marvellous work that he had done. I think it tells us that because God contemplated this superlative creation and spent a whole 24 hours doing so, that God could say later, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why? Because I have set it apart as a special time for you to contemplate me and my creation is part of me. And so the day was set aside. If you go to Psalm 111, the psalmist there has uh, somewhat to say, as he does in many places, about uh, creation. And uh, <coughs> we read there that uh, the creation was made to be remembered. One of the big problems that we have in the world today can certainly be traced to the fact that man is in confusion over who his creator is. If the world had never forgotten God as the creator and had always honoured what God set in place for his benefit, for our benefit, that is man's benefit, uh, the Sabbath day, man would have no confusion over who he is and what he is and his responsibility towards his fellow man and towards his creator. There would be no confusion about origins, where we came from and what we are. Well, let's read our verse, Psalm 111, 1 to 4. Praise ye the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honourable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth for ever. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. And so he goes on to talk about what the Lord does for his creation. The creation was made to be remembered. There's little doubt, of course, that God would ever forget his creation. But it's reassuring to know that he put a whole day into the creation week in which he will specially remember his creation. And I believe that every Sabbath that comes around, every seventh day that comes the Sabbath day, God turns his thoughts especially to his creation. I'm glad that God wanted to contemplate what he had done because in that God also gives special thought and in a sense it seems it brings a kind of humanity out of God in that he has compassion and that God has, has reason and that God has thought and concern for the creation that he had made. The psalmist says, the creation was made to be remembered and clearly God remembers his creation. And if God set this day aside as a sacred day, a day to be used for sacred purposes, <coughs> then I'm sure that fits right into the character of God who alone is holy. And so the creation was made to be remembered. Well, of course, we know that time went on and God's creation seemed to forget the Sabbath. And I suppose the most um, obvious example would be when the children of Israel were taken captivity. Uh, well, not taken captivity, but, uh, but fell into the hands of the Egyptians. They voluntarily went down there. Of course, circumstances drove them there, you might say. Over a period of 300 years or so, it seems that the Sabbath became uh, pretty hazy to them. And with their association with the Egyptian people, with all their philosophies of, and uh, religious uh, ceremonies and, and rites, paganism it was, the Sabbath became less and less important. Evidently, there were some faithful few there who kept the Sabbath. 
But when Moses uh, took the lead and took the people out of Egypt, one of the first things that God did was to re-establish their relationship with him. And one of the moves that God made to re-establish this relationship with him was to remind them of the Sabbath. And so in Exodus 28 to 11, which is the commandment uh, relating to the Sabbath, <clears throat> we see there, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then the reasons are given why they should, they should remember the Sabbath day. That is because God is the creator. God is their creator. What had they learned in Egypt? Well, they'd learned a lot of alternatives to being God, being the creator. They had learned one, probably one of three different theories about how they came into being. The most prominent <coughs> one was that they had come into being through the union of some very uh, erotic gods up there um, in some other realm. That would be the most popular. And that they were actually descendants of the gods. Do you know that there are religions who call themselves Christian today who have the same basic philosophy in their religion? And they are teaching that we are really gods ourselves. And that we are fallen gods, but one day we will be gods again. And we will go to a realm where we will actually own our own little department of, uh, of space out there and we'll be gods. The people who claim to be Christian teaching this stuff. And of course, it is really old Egyptian philosophy. So the children of Israel had to learn again about their God. And as they learnt about their God, they learnt about their origins. And as they learnt about their origins again, they would learn that their God was a good God. And so for an object lesson, God sent them manna six days of the week. But on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, the manna didn't fall. God was very strict about this in, that in, in the... the uh, or with the children of Israel as they uh, went through the desert there. At times it seems as though he was a little too hard. But remember, the people had to learn some very specific lessons in a very short time. And I tend to think that in this day and age it takes us a lot longer to learn our lessons than those people took to learn their lessons. And uh, those people had to learn to trust that God would provide for them on the Sabbath. So he gave twice as much manna on the Friday and it kept, which it didn't do the other days of the week. And on Sabbath they could enjoy the manna and fornetta ever they made from it and not have to worry about collecting it on the Sabbath. Well, we might think to ourselves, that's a pretty small thing. Just going out to collect some bit of food off the ground on the Sabbath, uh, why was God so fussy about all that? Well, God wasn't so fussy about just the fact of collecting some food but when God had provided everything for them, to reject the provisions that he had made for them was a rejection of him. Isn't that right? And when we reject the provisions that God has made for us, we are rejecting him. And so if we are to reject the provision that God has made in order that we might get to know him better, then we are really rejecting him. And if we reject the salvation that, Jesus, that uh, God offers to us through Jesus Christ, are we just rejecting Jesus? Jesus had a lot to say to the scribes and the Pharisees about that, didn't he? If you don't accept me, he says, you don't accept my father. And if we don't accept Jesus, we don't accept God. And if we don't accept the day that God has made in order that we can get to know him and know our creator, creator, <coughs> and know our, our roots and know who we are. If we reject what God has given to us to benefit us, we are rejecting him. And so the Sabbath was more significant than just having a day off work. God didn't need a day off work. A God as powerful as he didn't need a day off at the end of six days creation I'm worried if God was tired out and exhausted and had to put his feet up and sit in his celestial lazy boy chair and relax for 24 hours because he couldn't do any more, 
I'd be worried that by the time we got to the last hour of the Sabbath, he had dropped off to sleep and let the world go wild. But God wasn't like that. Adam and Eve weren't exhausted either. We're not too exactly sure where Eve came into the picture here, but Adam, of course, uh, represents the human race. And Adam, after he was created, had very little to do, really. It seems as though the line-up is this, that God created Adam, and uh, then perhaps uh, he brought the animals to him on that Friday. But when you look at the uh, whole account of Genesis, it could be that uh, there were other times that God brought the animals to Adam. It doesn't necessarily mean it was all done on that one day. Whatever the case, Adam didn't have much work to do. Other people claim, of course, that Adam was created just before sunset and had his life given to him just before sunset on Friday, in which case he didn't do any work. So Adam was brand new with a 100 million year guarantee on him and uh, nothing worn out and tired and he didn't have to put his feet up in his uh, uh, Edenic lazy boy chair either. So why did God give him a Sabbath? Why did God give him a whole 24 hours to rest when he hadn't done any work? Good to have bosses like that, wouldn't it? I'll employ you, but the first day of your work is to do nothing. You don't get bosses like that, do you? They just don't seem to be around. <clears throat> you see, God wanted the human race, the only part of his creation that's said to have been made in his image, to get to know his creator. And if man got to know his creator and understood him to be a God of caring, a, a God of compassion and a God of love and a God of intelligence and a God of reliability and all those other things that you could describe God by, then man would have a good foundation to live in relationship to all the rest of creation. I'm going to make a bold statement. I'm going to suggest to you that if human beings had honoured the Sabbath correctly, Right from the beginning, they would never have fallen out of harmony with the rest of creation. Why is it that man fell out of harmony with creation? Because he forgot what his creator was like. Read the account of the pre-flood days. Just a brief account, isn't it? Just a brief account. But man's thoughts were only evil continually. If man's thoughts were only evil continually, how much thought did they have for God? There was no thought for God if their thoughts were continually on evil because God is good. And then you look at the accounts of the way that different nations have acted down through the ages. They were as bad as the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah. But then when Jesus talked about some of the people in his day, their thoughts too were only evil continually for the very people who saw Jesus on the Sabbath day heal a man with a, uh, a withered arm and uh, other Sabbath healings, those very people that were condemning him had thoughts in their minds of how they might capture him and murder him. Were they keeping the Sabbath day? Of course not. Their thoughts were only evil continually. They had forgotten what God is like. And although they mechanically kept the Sabbath day and they made 658 rules as to how you should keep the Sabbath, they weren't Sabbath keepers at all. And they weren't honouring God by all that. And we look back in the Old Testament history, God said, I've had enough of all these sacrifices you make, all these bulls you kill, and all these goats, and all these sheep, and all the blood, and all the smoke, and all the incense, and all the stuff that you do for all these sacrifices. I've had enough of that. It means nothing. And even though you sacrifice a thousand bulls, and how many did uh, Solomon sacrifice at the uh, inauguration of his temple? He wasn't told to sacrifice thousands and thousands and thousands. That's something that crept in. They had misunderstood what God was all about. Why? Because they'd forgotten what the reason for the Sabbath was. That's why the Sabbath was made so that man might keep in touch with his creator and be constantly reminded of the goodness of his creator. If God reflected on his creation for one-seventh of time, and if God still reflects on his creation for one-seventh of time, how much more do you think you and I need to reflect 
on God and his creation. One seventh of our time hardly seems to be enough, does it? Considering what we are today. But God set the Sabbath in place for all creation for all time. And the Sabbath, which was embodied in uh, <coughs> the law at Sinai as a reminder to the people, is the Sabbath that's going to be the Sabbath that we keep in heaven. For Isaiah has uh, taken up the theme of the Sabbath very strongly. As one of those prophets of old who was taking the people back to a relationship with God. The people of Israel had uh, wandered a long way from God. They'd got involved in idolatry. And idolatry and paganism takes people away from the Sabbath almost from the start. And anything that is associated and connected with idolatry always takes people away from the importance of the Sabbath and the day that God set in place and... and uh, uh, sanctified and made holy it always does that if you take the Bible as a history book and for no other reason read it just for the history of it you will discover the Sabbath when it was lost and forgotten <clears throat> was lost and forgotten because people got involved with gods who are no gods and in this day and age, I think people, even so-called Christian people, have got themselves involved with gods that are no gods. Gods that aren't gods at all. The God of prosperity. The God of, uh, of uh, <coughs> prestige. The God of money, which comes into prosperity, I suppose the God of show, the God of popularity, all these kinds of gods. There's many of them out there. And when Christian people get involved with all these gods, even to the extent of considering the human race to be the greatest thing that God ever did, they are worshipping a God that is no God. And the Sabbath becomes of little significance to them. And so they cut themselves off from the very avenue that God uses to remind them of how they can keep their relationship with him and in so doing can be acceptable to him and therefore have the right bestowed upon them of eternal life. The Sabbath was made for all time. Because if God was pure and holy when he created the Sabbath, and Adam and Eve were pure and holy when they kept their first Sabbath, then should it not be, because this is a pure and holy thing, that it is also eternal? If you want to do a little study sometime, have a look in the Bible and see what is considered to be pure and holy that is also temporary. And you won't find it. That which is pure and holy is eternal. And if God's people want to be eternal, they have to be pure and holy. And the only way they can be pure and holy is by beholding that which is pure and holy. And therefore to behold God to come to know him who is pure and holy is essential if we are going to have eternal life. <clears throat> the devil is very keen, very keen on disrupting our relationship with God. And one of his prime, prime weapons is to lead people to positions and situations where they will forget him. No wonder God said, remember the Sabbath day. Exodus 22 and verse 31, God says, You shall be a holy people before me. You shall be a holy people before me. 
He is saying that you are to be a people set apart, you are a people to be a sanctified people, you are to be people who put me first, people who have me working with you and living amongst you. You are to be people set apart that are different from any other people. And one of the signs that will make you different is that you honour me on the Sabbath day. And that's why the prophet Isaiah tried to bring those people back to honouring the Sabbath. And he reminds them, in Isaiah 66, we read all about it, he reminds them that the Sabbath day is an eternal, an eternal thing that God has put in place. And even in the new earth, we're going to honour God on the Sabbath day. Why? Because it is a holy act because it is a sacred activity and because holy things are eternal and because God is eternal and if he is going to give us eternity then he is going to do it by keeping us in contact with him. In the last days of earth's history the devil is going to go back to his old tricks. He's going to take people's thinking away from their God the God who created him, uh, them, and uh, turn their thoughts towards the gods that are no gods. And their minds will be taken across to all kinds of thoughts um, <coughs> which have to do with material things and all kinds of theories which come in in the philosophical sense, and religion is one of those. In the last days of Earth's history, we can anticipate there will be an attack on the very basis of what keeps people close to God. What is that basis? It's the relationship forming time that we have with God. That's what it is. Our salvation is very much related to time. <clears throat> we know that we only have but a short time the devil knows that he also only has a short time and he is trying to make sure that in the short time that he has that he takes us where he's going. In the last days, as I have said, that which will keep a relationship with human beings and God in a way which will make them fit for eternity uh, will try to be, uh, by the devil, will try to be destroyed. He'll try and break that relationship. And uh, we have seen what has happened not too far into the Christian era when persecution failed to destroy the intense relationship that the early Christians had with God, the devil attempted to change our relationship to God in a very subtle way. And so Sunday keeping started to take the place of Sabbath keeping. And with no apology, the religious uh, <coughs> powers uh, of the time claimed that it was a good thing to do. Sunday keeping has its roots, of course, in paganism and in idolatry. And what did I say earlier? That as soon as a group gets involved with idolatry, out goes what? Out goes the Sabbath, the very thing that was designed to keep a good relationship between the creation and the creator. And the devil knew that if he could put that wedge in there and get human beings associated with idolatry, they would forget the real essence of who their creator is. Now that might sound as though by, uh, uh, <coughs> by uh, deduction that everybody who has worshipped on Sunday has been separated from God. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that as a general principle, this is what the devil put in place. And as a general rule, as you look through history for the last almost 2,000 years, you will see that the way of getting to understand God and understanding him as he really is has been terribly clouded. And it's been associated with a so-called Sabbath, a spurious Sabbath. And a lot of Christendom today, if we use that term, a term that's very popular with Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's not a bad term, a lot of Christendom